Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm back. We're back. A belated happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Yes. I hope everyone had a great week and a great Thanksgiving. Um, if you're new here, I'm Lola. And I'm Nay. And this is uh, Nalo's Thrift Talk, where we talk about uh, thrifting, reselling, and using those things to create a sustainable lifestyle and uh, living on your own terms. So. Yeah, very good. Um, very good synopsis there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so we are we are kind of new to YouTube, but we're trying to build up our channel, and we love talking about all things thrifting and how it impacts our lives, our personal lives as well. So. Yeah. And this show is all going to be about reselling 101. So we're going to talk about some of the lessons we learned the hard way. So hopefully you don't have to if you're new to reselling. And if you're not, we would love your feedback. What you know Throughout the show, if you have um, ideas or additions to yeah. what we're saying, so we can make a really great resource for new resellers. So we also, um, our show is not just geared towards resellers just for anyone newly tuning in we do talk about things you know just if you're just thrifting for yourself but maybe today you'll watch this show and you'll become uh you'll become a reseller you know based on you know some of these maybe this will inspire you so if you're already a thrifter um what, what is aoc Al, uh, alexandria ocasio cortez i don't know who that is she is a uh junior representative and She's gorgeous, and this is the best compliment I've ever made. Oh, wow. Okay. I'll have to look her She's up. She's also Latina. So. Oh, okay. Nice. Well, you do look gorgeous as a, as every day you do. So that was nice of William. Um, so and good morning, Elizabeth, too. Hi, oh, guys. hi, Elizabeth. Hello. Yeah, we have a couple more people joining us in the chat. So, um, Yeah, so we also have a special show at a special time next week. So mm -hmm. we just wanted to note that before we dive into today's show. Yeah, so we are we did a, a Christmas show with our guest Jenny Lorette, who is an expert in all things Christmas. But we wanted to also represent the people who celebrate Hanukkah, our our, our Jewish viewers. So we are going to have a uh, all Hanukkah show, just everything about Hanukkah. And also it's going to be a Judaica show. So broadly we'll be talking about um, collecting, you know, Judaica items. And we have a very exciting guest. His name is Zach Portman. He is an artist. He lives in Canada and he actually sculpts uh, beautiful Judaica um, items. And also he has a very interesting day job, which I won't give away. Uh, but, but his, his day job is, is very exciting too. So, um, we're going to have him on. We're so excited and it'll be talking just all things Hanukkah. You'll see us all Hanukkah festive, festive, and so yeah, so it'll be fun. So, uh, so anyone who wants to tune in, that's going to be at a special time next week. That will be next Wednesday, the eleventh at seven p.m. Eastern, four p.m. Pacific. Um, you know, just to um, accommodate our guest schedule, we're going to do it at a special time, and we'll probably still do something on Friday, maybe a haul or something, Lola. Right. On uh, yeah. our, our usual, yeah. time. we'll still we'll figure that out. But but we're definitely um, yeah definitely tune in next Wednesday at seven p.m. Eastern because it's going to be a really exciting Hanukkah show. Yeah, and if you don't celebrate Hanukkah, um, you know it, it'll and you're a thrifter, it'll 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 inspire you to you know to keep an eye out for those Judaica items as well. So right, there's our there's our guest Zach Corbin, and. As usual, what thrifted items are you wearing, Nay? Okay, so I have on this lovely hat. It is kind of like a beret. It is very 70s. Uh, the brand, it's it's something like Vortex or something like that. Um, but it's hand, it's 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 like it's hand knitted, it's it's super cute, it's so cozy and warm. So and I'm all about cozy and warm today because it's cold and you know, kind of cloudy here again. And so this sweater that I have on is um it's super soft, super warm, and as a bonus, it's hooded. So um, it's actually merino wool and mohair, and it's not itchy at all. It's just so soft, just makes me want to cuddle up. And and there is the label on it. It's Carberry Ireland, and I paid four dollars and ninety nine cents for this sweater, and I did buy it to resell. But once I tried it on, it was mine for life. So. 
<laughs> so it's not going anywhere. It's it's mine. So I don't really, but those Irish sweaters, especially Irish linen, but Irish, you know, any Irish mm -hmm. sweater, Irish and Icelandic sweaters can really go for a lot. So I might be able to get, you know, a good $50 for this if I were to sell it, but I'm not selling it because it's, oh, yeah. it's, yeah. and it's a cardigan too. It's got, it's buttoned all the way. So that and the hood, it's, it's mine. And as usual, or as happens very often without discussing this at all, we're wearing very similar things. Of course. So this is a beautiful, uh, also, um, sort of, well, it's not quite Irish knit. It's, um, Shetland wool and it was made in Hong Kong. So it's definitely vintage mm -hmm. and it's just a thick, wonderful cardigan. It has these beautiful leather buttons. And this was from Nadine. Nadine was sweet enough to send me a couple boxes of inventory since I have fewer chances to go sourcing out here. And, um, this was in it. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, I'm not selling this. And, and that's what I was hoping would happen when I sent it to her. <laughs> I looked at it and I was like, I was going to list it. And then I looked, I was like, no, this is so Lola. If she, if she, if it doesn't fit her, I knew, I knew you'd sell it, but I was hoping that it would fit. Cause I knew it was, it was so you. So it fits like a glove. It's perfect. And it's already quite chilly here. It is snowing currently. i um, just looking out the window. It's still snowing. And we got 14 inches of snow. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so very nice to have an extra cozy layer. Yeah. Here in, oh. I'm in Western Massachusetts now. So. I forgot too that I had gotten these from shopwood, shopgoodwill.com. Oh, it was just a basic pair of sterling earrings. I think I showed them to you. And you the yeah, so I was looking, I've been in the market for a good pair of sterling hoops. And I won the auction for four ninety nine, so they're so worth it. And um, you know, and they came in really great condition. So beautiful. And our next segment. Is, our next segment is drum roll. Thrifted home decor. Do you want to go first? Sure. So I have a couple things here. Uh, well, my Christmas lights behind me were thrifted from the bin, so I paid like nothing for them. I just decided to string some holiday lights to make the background a little festive. And this is a very special piece that I thrifted. Uh, the artist is, looks like Rebecca Odenga. Mm. And as for anyone that does not know this, I love giraffes. I'm trying to get, go, get away from the glare. And this is a giraffe. Yeah. Original a, little, a little closer. It's hard to see the top where it's lighter color. There you go. Yeah. It's so pretty. Yeah, it's it's really pretty. It's a one of a kind print. I mean, it's a numbered print, but it's a one of a kind, you know, item that I'm not going to find again. So, um, <clears throat> and it. I also got this from shopgoodwill.com, and I won the auction for seven ninety nine. So this is priceless to me because I I will be hanging it up somewhere. The frame that it's in isn't like a really good frame or anything. I might reframe it, but it's the mat. It's matted and everything. It's gorgeous. So. Um, yes. So this is my, and then I also have, you will appreciate this Lola, because I know that you like planters. I do. It's a cute little donkey. Oh, it's so cute. Yeah. So this is made in Japan and it's definitely vintage and I might actually put a succulent or something. In so right before the show, we were talking about all the vintage stores in my town. And one of the ones I went to, yeah, uh, not yesterday, the day before, they sold all of these things that like Nay and I would gravitate to in a thrift store and of course marked up a million times. And that was almost it's almost exactly like one they had in the store. Really? Oh my and god. They were selling it. And they were selling it with a little succulent in it. And I think it was like thirty or forty dollars. Mm. Yeah. Almost choked in my coffee. Maybe I will sell it. <laughs> I, well, if you fill it with a succulent, it'll be worth it. Honestly, I think if I sold it on eBay, I'd maybe get 20 for it or so. It's not yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Even though it's really cute and it's really vintage and all, it's, um, yeah, I think I'm going to end up putting a plant, a little plant in it or something. Oh, I would totally keep it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, once again, I have a similar item, not the planter, although I almost showed. And we did not plan this, by the way. So, I almost showed the new plant that I bought. And how I am planting it in a thrifted item, but maybe next week I'll do that I one. Really so, you know, um, our shared brain, how lovely. Yeah. Oh, that's so adorable. Yeah. So the oh, art is not been in your house room. before. Yeah, it was. It was in our living room. We haven't decided where to hang it here yet. So the art is was a gift from my cousin. Um, I don't remember who the artist is, but it. Um, we were in San Antonio, and so it was a local San Antonio artist, but. 
I wanted to share this because it's sort of a two part thrifted item. So the frame itself, I got probably at Salvation Army in high school. I've had it forever. I had it in my dorm room in college and I was reading detail around the edges, it looks like. Yeah, it's um it's beautiful carved wood. Okay, yeah. Solid wood. And I love that it has the carving, but it's not super ornate. So it's very easy to add into any decor. And it was missing the glass. Okay. And then a few years ago, I was at um, Philly Aid Thrift, which is one of our favorite thrift stores in Philly. And they had a replacement glass from like the 70s that had never been opened. So I oh, heard a story previously. So yeah, so it was just a, a great um, opportunity to use something that someone had you know purchased and never gotten around to using before, and you yeah, know now I have a full frame and a great place for this amazing taco cat that I love. It is adorable. What a cute taco cat! And as a as an added trivia bonus, taco cat cat is taco cat backwards and. Taco Cat. Yeah. My kids actually have a shirt that that says "Taco Cat" is Taco Cat spelled backwards or something like that. But, it is, and in, just in general, I love tacos and I love cats. So I yeah, really so, and as do I actually vegetarian tacos. But. There are good vegetarian tacos. Yes, and we also have the return of a favorite segment this week. Oh yes. Thrifted history. So Nadine found an item recently that had a very cool story and a very cool Philly connection. So I will let Yeah, you. so I have not sold this item yet, but I did find it at Philadelphia Goodwill a little while ago. I just got around to listing it recently for $4.99. And it was well worth that price because it is a beautiful, beautiful hand knit sweater. It's heavy. If you feel the weight of it, I should have, I actually could have brought it in person. I don't know why I didn't think of that. Um, but I but, do have a listing though. So okay. Listing might be easier to see the pictures actually. So um, <clears throat> there, there it is. So if you look at it, it's got like kind of a nature tree inspired um, design to it. And you can see it more on the back. Uh, yeah, so see it's it's wheat and she did a lot of trees and a lot of nature. And her name is the artist, the artist, I should, she is an artist actually. Um, her name is Sandry da Sandy Dondrade. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And it is so heavy and so well made. It's it's um, like I said, it's hand knit. It's qu high quality. So she's actually. I I looked up her information to see because I didn't know who it was. I'm, I have this in my listing pile. I could tell it was quality, but I didn't know who or what. You know, it has a really interesting story behind it. So her name is Sandry Dondrade. John Drade. Uh, she's a costume designer from Philadelphia. And she's been creating handmade network for over 30 years, knitwear for over 30 years. Now I saw some of her listings on Etsy that go back to the 70s, some of the, her more vintage items. So she has been, uh, you know, well over 30 years. He, she's been in, so she, she's been doing this for quite a while and she's still in business. And her designs are, are inspired by the opera. And she does skirts, scarves, jackets, and gowns too. There are some, and I, I've seen some of these dresses, these long gowns are just amazing and they go for the hundreds, you know, so. Um, and <clears throat> her signature is called Winter Tree and it does not have leaves, but it serves as a symbol of life. And you can see that kind of is echoed in that design as well. And she turned her artistry into supporting the chat. Now, Lola, I'm going to pronounce this wrong. I'm going to butcher it. It's Chata, Chata, Chata. I think it's Chow Talka. Chow -talka. Um, that sounds like it might. Yeah. Uh, opera, young artist, um, <clears throat> young artist guild through the chat. Alqua Opera Guild for the last 12 years. So what she's been doing is, and this is in New York State, somewhere in New York State. And what she's been doing is she's had an annual trunk show where this one might have been sold. And she and people would 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 flock to the opera. They they'd make their visit, their annual visit to that time of year when she had her trunk show. And what she would do is she'd donate the proceeds to the Chat Aqua. Uh, opera young artist guild so she was supporting the art supporting young artists and she began selling her recently she kind of um she stopped the trunk shows but she kind of um she kind of grew because she's now selling her designs in a showroom year-round there so 
Um, and if you're interested in more information, um, there is a blog you can, um, I think we'll, um, we'll add the link. In the notes. Yeah, you can pop that into the notes later. Yeah. But anyway, it's a very interesting story because here is, you know, I just stumbled upon this piece and it turns out that it has this really cool history to it. So, and she's a Philadelphian. And yeah, she's originally from Philadelphia. So, and I did find it in Philadelphia. So and that makes sense. Yeah. 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 And so on to our main topic. Our main topic. Yeah. Reselling 101. So 10 things that we wish that we knew as resellers when we began. So, you know, hopefully you can learn from some of our mistakes are, you know, some of the some of the ways that we've grown. Hopefully you can grow as well. So yeah. and and like I said earlier, if you are an experienced reseller and you have any, you know, anything to add to what we say, um, leave it in the chat and or in the comments if you're watching the replay. Yeah. Uh, but if you're in the chat, we can also, you know, respond to that and, and add in some collaborative ideas. Um, yeah. And if you're an experienced reseller, you know, don't don't tune us out because you might you might get some great tips for, you know, for yourself too. It doesn't just because you're an experienced reseller doesn't mean that you won't benefit from some of this information as well. So totally. That was, yeah, that was our idea as we were putting this together. Yeah. So our first tip comes from Nadine. Yeah. So my first one is <laughs> stay organized and I have trouble. That's almost like, it's almost like an irony for me to say that because I am not an organized person and that's okay because I kind of, I call it my organized mess, you know, my, my organized chaos. But if I have things organized to a point, if you're not an organized person like me, if you have them organized to a point, you can still, um, you know, you can still find things if you know where they are. But my, my, my tip is to organize at day one. And you need to have a plan in place ahead of time for organizing your inventory and keep track of it. So I learned the hard way that is way too hard to backtrack that and to do it after you've already started reselling. Like right now I need to come in, I need to come up with some sort of number place, but I have over a thousand listings between all the platforms that I sell on. So, and I have unlisted items too. So that is a really, really difficult task now to go back and, and come up with a numbering system. You start at day one with number item number one and you start start tagging your items, you know, and, and your inventory boxes, you know, your bins or however you have them stored from day one, then you are way ahead of a lot of resellers who've been selling for many years like myself. Totally. I think one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard is start as you mean to go on. So just because you're a beginner baby reseller and you have 10 items, imagine yourself with a thousand. And I think that also helps you envision that future where you are at that level, even if you feel intimidated by the beginning of the process. Yeah. Um, and so my addition to that is uh, tip number two which is track your data. So I think organize, organization is really important in terms of storage and making sure you know which item is where, mm -hmm. but also keep a spreadsheet. I like to do it in Google Sheets because it's super easy to pull up if I'm on my computer or sometimes to list from my iPad. And, um, or even if I'm trying to find the item and I need to like pull it up on my phone while I'm digging through, through my storage. The best thing for me is that the spreadsheet also um, includes my cost of goods, my research comps, the platforms where I'm selling it, which is great because I do cross list items. So that way I never forget where to take down a list if it's sold. And over time, you can use that data to track how things are going for you. So if you have a, a brand that you've tried three times and both and all three times it's just total flop. Like you don't pick up that brand again, but you might forget unless you can look back and say, oh yeah, I really, mm -hmm. I really didn't make much of a profit on that. Or, uh, you know, I think a really big thing is things change over time. And sometimes it's really easy to feel like a kinship or a love for a brand that's done really well for you in the past, but you have to find like, it's just not what it used to be. And if you have those numbers, you can really easily see that. That, down there are so many brands that, that are yeah. like that, that used to, I remember the juicy couture bags they used to sell for, you know, in the hundreds, you know, when I first started reselling, they were going and, and you would buy them in the store to resell. If you bought one, if you found one for 80 bucks to flip, you know, you could mm -hmm. make money. Now you can't get them away. So 
Anthropology, I think, is another great one. It still sells, it just doesn't. Yeah, but it, and it depends on the anthro brand. Too, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. So there's so many brands that are like that. And John says, admitting your messiness is the first step in doing something about it. Amen. Yeah. I, I've admitted it. I think my inventory is fairly well organized. The rest of my life, not so. You're much. more organized than I am. I'll say that, and I'll never be a really super organized person. It's not the way my brain works. Um, I'm yeah. bipolar, and, and and bipolar people tend. It's just a trait that I have that we're we're very highly creative people, and all of our energy is is you know towards you know the creative side of our brain and the logical like math and you know the organizational side. It just doesn't. It's not as fired up. So, the best thing I ever did was marry someone who's very organized. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's that's yeah, that's so you kind of balance each other out. Um, so I do have a little backstory for um, Henry's comment. He said, I, I was wondering about that. That you have the right pictures. So yeah, so that's kind of I guess that would be kind of a little added bonus tip that that Henry. So Henry bought a a kit for me, um, um, embroidery kit for me. And it was a Christmas stocking, plastic canvas, embroidery. And what I did was I had I listed two in the same day, but they were different. And I mixed up the pictures. I swapped out the pictures. So when he got it, he was looking at the pictures from the listing and he's saying, this doesn't match the picture, but it was the right item. Just I had put the wrong picture in. So if you are listing multiple um, items of the same similar, you know, similar items, make sure that you're not, that you've had your coffee, that you're paying attention and um, that you don't mix up your photos like I did. So there's another little added bonus tip. Luckily to get the right item, it would just have the wrong picture. So. Mookie's looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said he was probably going to make a, a cameo appearance, so maybe he'll jump up. Um, Elizabeth says, oh, there's yeah. a Google Sheets app for your phone. Yes, there is. I, it annoys me to no end. It's just like kind of clunky, but it is really good in a pinch. Um, yeah, so we're trying to use that uh, Lola and I now, and I am having I'm I'm a little less um, less tech savvy than Lola is, and I'm having a little bit of issues with uh, editing them on my phone. But you can, yes, I know that there's. I think my biggest problem with the phone app too is that um, you have to zoom up so much. Now that my phone screen is shattered, yeah. I can't do that. So I just I just shattered my screen yesterday. That was. Um, but I think you have to zoom up so much because it's so tiny that it's hard. It's hard, and you know, they click the wrong spot, and so theoretically you can do it, but it, it is harder. But it is good in a pinch if like you need to re uh, reference it while you're outsourcing, and you exactly. want to say, oh, do yeah. I? How much did that sell for last time? Or do so I have that already in my inventory? Yeah, very valid point, Elizabeth. I was just saying that it doesn't always. It's it, it is a little cumbersome. So <clears throat> our next um, our next um, tip is. Um, list as you get your inventory. And this is another thing that I could have learned from because I have death pile. I have massive death piles. Like, I mean, massive, man. I have death piles still in Philadelphia an hour from where I live now. So, um, so what you need to do is don't just put it in a pile and buy more. That is how the death piles, or some people call them profit, profit piles. If you're looking at the glass half full. Um, <laughs> um, but that's how they accumulate fast. So remember that things sell out of season. And some sellers want to list seasonal items with just when they're in season. But make sure that you're the one that has the winter coat in July for the buyer who is going to Siberia in July and needs that winter coat. You know, you never know. So yeah, so definitely, um, you know, keep listing, listing, listing year round. And when you buy, a, like I actually recent trip to the bins that I did. I'm proud of myself because I actually did do this. I, I, I've listed just almost everything in my hall, just came home, listed, listed, listed. And you know what, when you bang it out like that, it's really not that hard, but if you put it to the side and you let it sit, then it sits with the other stuff that you put to the side. And then you have this, this, this insurmountable Mount Everest uh, death pile that you, you know, that you feel overwhelmed. And I'm in that, I'm in that point right now. That's I sent Lola some inventory recently because I just have so much to get to that. I'm never, I know I'm never going to get to it all. So. Yeah. And all of that, just the mental toll of knowing you, you know, you have all this to do. It takes energy. It takes like emotional energy. And I think it's easy to kind of discount that. But, you know, the more you're on top of things, the more you're clear minded and, and can, you know, keep moving forward and feel productive and like get that momentum going. Yes. Okay. So my next tip is to check your comps carefully. 
this is something I think is really important to do when you're first starting out. Um, and once you have done it for, you know, a few months or a year, you'll start remembering all of that information in your head just kind of naturally and get an instinct for things. But it is the best way to make sure that you're not wasting your money, especially if you're trying to start your business on a very shoestring budget. So you want to look at sold listings and you can do this easily on eBay and Poshmark. Mm -hmm. um, I have mentioned this before, but I really like searching for the item in um, just in Google and then pulling up Google images because it's one way that you can easily find listings on multiple platforms at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the image will come up, you know, if it was on listed on eBay, listed on Poshmark, and you can see, uh, you can compare the platforms pretty quickly that way. Um, it's great to do it at the store if you can. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes there's really bad cell reception. You can't get on the internet. Um, I know some people think that's intentional now, which I don't, I don't know. I think it's probably more that thrift stores are usually in big industrial buildings, but, um, so, you know, do as much as you can on the spot. And then if you come home and you check comps more carefully and you have a dud, think of that as a lesson because that's, you know, you're still going to get your money back probably and may, maybe make a small profit if not a huge one. But it's um, it's a learning experience, and all of that will accumulate in knowledge that will make you an expert thrifter later on. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to add one little thing to that, Lola. Yeah, go ahead. Um, pay attention to nuances with items because, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, like there can be, um, uh, for example, um, Ralph Lauren. If you find something Ralph, you don't just look up Ralph Lauren sweater. You might have a purple label there. That is a, you know, that is a higher end Ralph Lauren that's going to bring you more. Or you might just have a, you know, a lower end label of the same because there's there's different, um, what's that called, Lola? Diffusion brands? Diffusion? Yeah, diffusion brands. Yeah. So there's different, you know, different levels. Like a D&G D &G Dolce, Dolce Gabbana is not going to bring the same as a, as a regular Dolce Gabbana. I just had a, a friend message me recently. Um, he had a dress that was Dolce Gabbana. He said, why isn't this Dolce Gabbana dress selling? And I said, because it's because he had it overpriced for a D&G. It was a D&G and he didn't realize that. So, you know, so definitely look at nuances. Is your board game a special edition? Is it just a sealed edition? That's, or is it that special edition that's going to bring more? Is it, you know, so you might get excited. You know, you see a pair of sneakers that sell for or, you know, in the hundreds, but then you realize that that's a certain, you know, a certain edition of them or, um, you know, the high top version of them or something. So definitely pay attention to nuances too. Don't just, you know, be, be careful when you're searching. Totally. You know, and size, that trap before. Yeah. Size can also be a factor. So usually in an extra large will sell for a little yeah. bit more just because it's harder to find that size. Yep. Um, so yeah, definitely. That's a great, great tip. Yeah. Um, John has a couple great questions. Okay. So this for you, Nay, do you prioritize your listings by the value or what you personally like to sell? By the value, I would say, because even though it's, yes, it's what I would personally like to list better. Some days, you know, yeah, I am in the mood to just list. I, I For some reason, I hate listing pants. I don't know why, because they're the easiest thing to photograph, but I hate measuring them and I hate listing them. So some days when I'm like that, I'll just like do something I like. Like I love listing shoes. Shoes, oh, I could list shoes all day long. So, you know, I'll just, but, but for the most part, if I have a really expensive item, you know, or higher valued items, I'm not going to let them sit and list, you know, the 20 buck, the 20 buck item over the, you know, $100 or $200 item. I'm going to get those higher ticket items listed so that I can get the, the money so that my money is not tied up for as long as it needs to be, you know, longer than it needs to be. So that's a great, great point. Yeah. And for me, uh, do you price items on the higher low end? I always go for the high end. Um, part of that is especially because on Poshmark, but now increasingly on eBay, you're getting more exposure for dropping the price, for giving an offer to likers or watchers, yeah. and you really need to leave room for that. Um, but also, I've had you know people come in and pay outright for the high end of the of the price that was more than I was expecting, and you just you know you never know when that can happen. So. And also if you have a good reputation, if you have a better selling reputation than someone else, or you have better pictures, or you just look like a seller that's more, you know, reliable, then they might go for your item and pay more than they would over someone else's. Uh, also to add to that, which I think we should do a whole episode on at some point, but the SEO of your listings, if you're coming mm -hmm. up first in Google, 
people are lazy. They're going to click on the first listing. That's true. And if it's yours, if it's more expensive, it's still likely to sell faster. So, yep. Oh, my Mookie boy. Yeah, Mookie is just sitting in my lap. And Wait, that's my nephew. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, another one is to, our next one is to be picky when sourcing. Yeah, definitely. It's easy to overwhelm yourself when thrift stores have sales or while shopping at the outlets. And we did hit, I hit on this just a little bit in our thrift, in the thrifting episode, but it's also really, really important to be doing this when you're sourcing for resale because, um, you know, you have to put a value on your time. There, there comes a point when, you know, it, it takes you just as long to, to research and photograph and list a $5 item as it would, um, you know, and ship it to pack it for shipping as it would to list, you know, the same item or, or a, an item that would bring you $50 or more. Um, <clears throat> and you also have to think about, you know, the value of your time also with something breakable, you know, maybe it's a $20 item, but you can list a $20, $20 item. You can use your funds to purchase a $20 item that isn't breakable, that doesn't need that extra bubble wrap and the, all the packing materials and your time into, you know, into packing it and then worrying about, is it gonna break? Is, I'm not saying don't buy breakables, I'm not trying to scare, but I'm just saying like, you know, sometimes you have to think about what is, wh where your, you know, your time is money too. So definitely be picky and um, remember that, um, it's, you know, sometimes, sometimes it is, it is um, better to pass up some of the dirt cheap items because that is, again, talking about death piles, how your death piles will accumulate fast. Um, you know, I don't know how many times early on that I made that mistake where I was all excited, you know, um, I remember there was one sale, one of the good bulls was going out of business when I first started reselling and it was a fill your bag for, I think it was like $5 or something. I walked out of there with so many bags and I was like, yes, I have all this inventory, but guess what? Some of that inventory from all those years ago, I think I still probably have some of it sitting because it wasn't like, you know, it was just kind of like, eh, but you know, and I didn't look it over real well. Some of it had flaws, some of it. And now uh, maybe I would have walked out of that store with one bag knowing what I know now. So that's a great point. And uh, just one thing I was thinking of while you were saying that is if you find an item that's slightly damaged or it has some stains and you think I can get those stains out, which I do all the time. And I actually really love the thrill of like yeah. getting a stained item and making it look brand new again. But that takes time, too. So if you're yeah. trying to factor in uh, factor in the value of your time, think about the entire in like time input you're putting in. I have to think about who you are as a person, too, because like. For Lola to buy something with a little, with a, one little hole in it to get reset is a lot different for me because I, I'll end up paying money and taking it to my cleaners by the time, if, by the time I finally get around to it, Lola is handy, you know, like that. She's crafty so she can, she can just sew it herself, you know, she can. So it also keep in mind with what, what can you fix, you know, what can you do um, yeah. yourself, you know, what's, what, what are you comfortable with, you know, and, and because me, like I'll, I'll end up, like I just sent some of my projects to Lola because I know I'll never get around to them and I know Lola will so yep that's actually on my to-do list for today is I have a few items that need need some soaking and some TLC yep. that you sent me another great question from John how important is knowledge of selfie rates um, to help you in deciding what to source and what to pass you know I look at them only when I'm about to invest a little bit more money in an item so like a good example is dresses um, because Goodwill tends to have, now that's like $7.99, $9.99 for a dress. Um, so if I'm investing more than three or $4, I'll probably check the, you know, the dates on eBay for when, when things are sold, how fast they're selling. Um, but otherwise, I, I don't worry too much about it because I'm fine with things sitting. Um, so I have a different strategy for that a little bit. Um, if I see something that's that the market is flooded with, a brand that the market is like, for example, Coach. Okay, um, you know the, the brand. The market's pretty flooded. You you search a Coach bag and you can see there. But so I will hone in on it a little bit. Like I'll get a little more specific. What style do I have? What? And then from there, if this is only if I have something that the market is flood is saturated with. Okay, so then from there, um, I will search out. Um, I'll search out the just the completed items and see how many are still red, how many didn't sell. Um, and if there's an influx of those, I'll, I'll think, you know, like that's probably, probably too inundated. And then I'll also search the solds, the green ones, you know, on eBay. And I'll see what, 
actually sold, what actually was, you know, sold and, and how many were. So, you know, and, and that's not, you know, I'm not going to get an exact number. I just do a quick search like that when I'm in the store and I kind of can that way, you know, mentally do the, do, you know, figure out if it's, if it is something that, that I'm still willing to pick up, even though the market's a little saturated for that, you know. Totally. That's, yeah, that's also great advice. Okay. So this one builds off a little bit, some of what we've already said, but um, to be aware of your hidden costs. So on top of, you know, how much time you're investing, you're also have, you're thinking about, so listing fees, um, I think, especially new sellers on eBay, sometimes they can take you by surprise because you're not quite prepared for how much they add up. Um, especially when you're a new seller, it's really easy to underestimate the cost of shipping and have to eat some of that cost yourself, which is totally normal, but you know, just be prepared for that learning curve. And um, other things like the cost of bubble wrap, if you're selling a breakable item, that that's mm -hmm. going to eat into the profit for that item a little bit. Um, you know, it's not a huge amount of money, but when you're running you're a business, better, your shipping supplies for free, remember that it's still an expense because it's still your time and, and that's you know, you're getting them. And, you know, so even if you're, if you're saying, you know, to Lola's coming, oh, well, I get mine for free. It's still, there's still valuable resources there. Right. Yeah. And it's, I mean, things like I mean, bubble wrap um, and like void fill and stuff like that, you can definitely repurpose stuff for that. But sometimes you just need to buy, you know, new bubble wrap if you have a very breakable Absolutely. item and you yep. want to carry yep. it around safely. Um, so my biggest tip within this tip is even if you're starting out with, you know, really no money, which I think a lot of, especially on YouTube and Instagram, resellers like to love, you know, they love to talk about how you can do this with no startup capital whatsoever and just start with selling stuff around your house. And that's totally true. But I would say, you know, if you're selling 20 items, take the profits from 10 of those for your first, you know, thrifting trip to find inventory and save the rest in your PayPal account, or even better, start a separate checking account for your eBay business. One, and I still to this day don't don't end up doing that when I say I should have a pad. Yeah, the, the, you know, a little bit of a pad because mm -hmm. I think it's Ruby Lane. You have to have a certain amount in your um, in oh. your account with them in order to start selling. I think it's like 150 bucks or a hundred dollars or something that you have to have sitting there to start. With it. And I'm sure that's why that makes sense. It's, it's like return, you know, returns and, you know, especially on eBay, you can get a return like a month later. Mm -hmm. And You know, if it's a hundred dollars item and you don't have that hundred dollars on hand right then you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. So. And it's like I, I said, you know, it's, it's totally, totally normal to be blindsided by some of these costs. I think everybody, gets, you know, surprised by one hidden cost or another of, of the reselling business. And as long as you have that buffer, it's just not going to phase you, you know, yeah. and, and the worst is to have, you know, so, you know, spent all the money you made so far on new inventory and not have that, you know, even 20, $30 readily available just to refund someone. So, yep. I've been there before. So <laughs> no, yeah, I think we all, you know, all of us at some point or, or another. So don't don't make that mistake because then you have to scramble, you know, like to um to refund. That, you know? Or worst comes to worst, you have to wait for it to go through your bank account, which which then the then the buyer has to wait for their refund, which is which is yeah. not really fair to them. So exactly. This is yours. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just sitting here like hi. <laughs> Okay. So, yeah, so join, so definitely, yeah, find your people. So what we mean by that is join Facebook groups like the thrifting board that we talk about, um, watch YouTube channels like ours, um, you know, definitely make reseller friends and you'll learn from them. One thing I found that for the most part, the reseller community is so friendly and so embracing and not competitive to the point where, you know, there's enough to go around. And I mean, there are people who don't have that mindset, but they don't get very far. You know, they, they don't, they're not the successful one. So, you know, keep, you know, just get in those circles, um, you know, attend an event. If there's an eBay event or a Poshmark, um, Posh and Zip or something near you, attend an event and, you know, definitely network, network, network. And don't be afraid to reach out, you know, and ask questions. Don't be, just be a lurker on the thrifting board or, you know, not, or if you see something, you know, someone that's local, don't be afraid to message them and reach out and say, Hey, you know, I'm, I, I go to that thrift store too. You know, you might make it a new thrifting buddy, you know? So, but you, but the most important thing is you'll learn from them and you'll learn from their mistakes. They'll learn from you. So 
definitely, um, you know, get out there in the community and make friends and watch and listen. Absolutely. And I think the benefits you get of having a supportive community and, you know, the, the tips you might get for sourcing or the advice you might get on an item that's unfamiliar to you from another reseller, it is so much more valuable than whatever you might make by keeping your sourcing, you know, secrets and not oh, yeah. what you do and what works for you. So, yeah, because they're like, there's so much, there's so much, so much in the waste stream in this, especially in this country that there, there's, it's not going to, you don't have to worry about other people, you know, figuring out your, because everybody has their own expertise too. You know, yeah. you have expertise that someone else doesn't have and so there's enough of it to go around. Why not share it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have an interesting comment from William about uh, retail arbitrage. I assume that's what you mean by RA. Yeah. Doing it from the store without purchasing anything. If it sells, go back and purchase it. That would terrify me. Yeah, if it works for you, that's awesome. I personally would just fear for that, you know, that one time I can't fulfill an order and on eBay you have so few strikes. Um, yeah. But, you know, that is one way to do it if you don't have a ton of money. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's just, I think it's risky. <laughs> I, I've never done it because it would just, it would, and it, believe me, I've thought about it, you know, I, I, the thought has, you know, but never done it because. Yeah, I think the only thing I might do along those lines is buy like one or two. And if they sell like hotcakes, then I'd be like, okay, I can definitely go back in my 10. But and this might not be so ethical, but you can, like, if you make a mistake, you know, you can, you can always return something to the store too. If it doesn't, if you realize that it's not going to. But that's, again, that's kind of iffy with the... And I would note on that, because um, we talk a lot about the collabs at like Target. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking, like the Target collabs. Well, but a lot of those, they they intentionally will limit the return window for like, mm -hmm. you know, instead of unlimited, you know, Target's always great about returns, but for like... That could be like a 14 day window or something, yep. So be aware of that if you do want to try and sell those limited edition items. That is very true with the collabs, yes. Yeah. Um, so my next tip is for anyone who's watching YouTube videos like ours to take notes and keep them handy. So this could be something, you know, you're watching a video and there's a bolo brand you don't know, or we say something that, you know, is new, new advice to you or another, you know, another show has some great advice, write it down, keep it somewhere where you can reference it really easily. And two ways I really like to keep notes are on my phone. Uh, one is in the notes app. So keeping a note of bolos or keeping a note of brands to skip that you've been tricked by before, <laughs> or, you know, um, a certain category of item that you want to remember to look out for that you haven't bought before, things like that. So you can really easily just kind of pull them up while you're on the go. And then also I like to keep a photo album on my phone of pictures of like my listing pictures that I've edited and have the comps that I researched just like written, you know, onto the item. Um, so Wait, that, you have, what, what is that? I, I didn't get like, exactly picture. Oh, oh, so at least on the iPhone and I assume there's a similar uh, feature on Android, but I don't have an Android phone. You can annotate your photos. Oh, so, right. So I will, you know, once I've listed my, my item and especially after it's sold, I can go in and add text over my photo, my listing photo, and say, right. the comp, you know, comps for this item are. Oh, yeah, see, you're, yeah, see, I, and I know you can do that, but I, I, that's not something I've taken advantage of. So that's a great tip. Yeah. And, and then you can do it again with, you know, once it's sold. And, and, um, mm -hmm. and that way you can literally just kind of like skim through your photos if you find a similar item. Like, oh, I know I sold this before. That and is a great tip. Comps, yeah. I've never thought of that. That's a wonderful tip. Yeah. So. Okay, so I just learned something from our show too. And your next tip? Learn, yeah, learn more than one platform. So different platforms, different things sell better on different platforms. And, um, you know, you can start on one platform like eBay, which I would say is probably the easiest because you can sell everything on eBay. It's, it is a learning curve. I'm not gonna say it's not hard. You know, it's not, any platform is gonna be a learning, learning curve, but, um, you know, then you can branch out to, but you don't wanna overwhelm yourself being a new, reseller and having to learn multiple platforms at the same time because you know master one you know get familiar i would say ebay is a good one um to start out with because like i said you can 
list anything and you can list clothing, you can list um, CDs, you can list, you know, anything under the sun there. So that's definitely one that, um, you know, you're more limited on some other platforms, but, um, and then, you know, then, then take your time to learn some more, but definitely once you, once you've mastered that a little, know that some things, not all platforms are equal and some things will sell better on some platforms than others, the same item, perhaps I've sold, you know, certain brands and certain things on eBay that, you know, like some of the vintage or more obscure brands that wouldn't necessarily sell as well on Poshmark and vice versa. I've sold some of the, some brand names. Um, like I find that, you know, even though Anthro doesn't do as well, it does better for me on Poshmark than it does on eBay. Same thing with Lululemon. It does better on Poshmark for me than it does on eBay. Um, you know, so definitely no Etsy for, you know, more crafty stuff, like, you know, um, handmade stuff. So know your plat, learn your platforms. Once you have a mastery of them, know what to list where, you know, just get, and you can get, and like all, like we said, watching YouTube, watching um, our show, watching Thrifty Business, watching, you know, the thrifting board, um, you know, any, all of those things too can help you to do that too, to, to learn. So use all of your resources and um, definitely know what to list where. Totally. I would say, I think uh, Poshmark is much more user-friendly for the casual sellers. So yeah, it has a, yeah, it does have a little it, bit of a better learning curve. But the advantage to starting with eBay instead is that once you know eBay in and out, Poshmark is a breeze. Like It's going to be so much easier for you to list on Poshmark if you've already you know, gotten used to all of eBay's item specifics and you know, shipping and stuff. So Somebody who might not be as social media savvy, um, it might be a little more intimidating by Poshmark because with all the sharing and it is kind of more of a social media integrated platform. Um, you know, so somebody that's not as, as, as savvy with social media might find it a little bit more challenging than other platforms. But um, yeah, but I mean, it, it is definitely, you know, once you get going, once you learn eBay, Poshmark is a breeze pretty much. Um, yeah. And, you know, diversify too, like when other people say, you know, like you hear people say, you know, the sky is falling, eBay is dead. It's, you know, um, even if it's true, you don't have to, even if that were to be true, which it never is, yeah. you don't have to worry because if you're slow on one platform, that's happened to me a lot of times where I'm, there, things are just slow on one platform, but I'm selling on the other and that's sustaining me. So, um, you know, so if you don't have that backup, you know, put your eggs in more than one basket. I think that's the saying. So that, yes, that is the perfect right. way to put it. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and our last piece of advice is have fun. So this is my philosophy, and I've talked a little bit about it before in other episodes, but basically what you love most is going to be the best way to structure your business. So if there's something that everybody is saying to do on Instagram or YouTube and you just don't like running your business that way, don't do it. Don't don't feel pressure to do it just because everyone else is. And if you listen to your own instinct, you're going to direct your business in a way that is going to be the most profitable for you. So I think if if you are enjoying the work, you're more likely to put the effort and the work into it. And the more work you put into it, the more money you're going to make. So that might be that might mean um, you know, cut your teeth on clothes and then realize that you actually have this great niche because you have expertise in an area and that becomes the only thing you sell. Um, even though most people start and many people keep doing clothes like we do um you know don't sell you feel like we're hating on glassware on this episode which i don't want to do because you know that's also a great niche but if you don't like packing breakable stuff don't list breakable stuff and that's you know one stressor that's off your plate and you no longer have to worry about it yeah definitely um so, yeah yeah and I, like i had mentioned you know i love listing shoes and on some of those days when I just don't feel like listing other items. I know if I get a pile of shoes, it'll excite me enough that I'll get into the, the groove of listing because I just love my shoes. So, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, we have a couple of great questions. Uh, so John asks, what do you think some, why do you think some platforms become more known for selling certain items? I think it's all about branding and they're all very, very- I'm gonna say the same thing. I was thinking the same. Right now is a great, great time to get a grip on like what each platform wants its sellers to be selling because they're all advertising on TV for the most part. Yeah, and I think it's also the grassroots of each 
um, yeah, platform to the roots because like, for example, Poshmark started as just clothing. Now you can sell housewares and I would imagine they're going to branch out to some other items, you know, Probably. like you can't sell like music and CDs and um, you're not supposed to sell like perfume and um, some of the, you know, so I, I think they're going to branch out more, but it started out as a clothing, you know, oriented fashion savvy kind of sell from your own closet thing. Mm -hmm. So that, and that's still kind of what a lot of people view it as eBay started as auctions and, you know, like uh, things from your own home and, you know, antiques and, and, um, you know, stuff like that, vintage items. And it's kind of still got that, you know, a lot of people still have that mindset to say, and Amazon newly packaged items and books. A lot of people still think that, you know, even though each platform maybe is trying to market a little differently these days, um, some yeah. are maybe trying to become others too much, but <laughs> um, sometimes I think it's, um, it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's the roots and what they started out as too. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth, another great question. How important do you think it is to have low price point items? Sorry about the cat, but um, to balance out higher things. So I think this goes to my last tip um, in my personal philosophy about reselling is it totally depends on the strategy that you want to build your business on and what you want your business model to be. I know this is a piece of advice that a lot of people give is like have lower end items, have higher end items. It's definitely helpful like on Poshmark because people will bundle and if you get have a bundle discount on your store, which you can set like 15, 20% off mul uh, multiple items in one purchase. It's great to have like, you know, Forever 21 stuff because someone will throw that in their cart because then it triggers the discount. However, personally for me, I get so frustrated seeing those cheap Forever 21 shirts in my inventory that I know aren't listed for much. And when they do sell, I'm going to make like five bucks. And I put time into you know, mm -hmm. listing and photographing and sharing on Poshmark and everything. It's just not something I enjoy. And I think it's also just as valid to say, I'm going to specialize in high end and I might have less inventory, but each of my items are going to have an average sale price of 60 to hundred dollars, you know, and if that's what you're known for, then you're going to build that clientele too. So it's, it's all about your business model. Yeah. And it's also, it also goes to, it also is a profit margin. Like you can look at, a, at an item that's $10 and think, well, they have no profit margin, but they might be only shopping at the bins and they might be getting those items for like pennies on the dollar. And so, you know, but I think for the most part, like I would, for me, it's not really necessarily about price point as it is about diversity in brands and types of items. So with that comes, I think, different price points. But for me, it's more about overall diversity. Having said that, like I said before, time is money. And, you know, it, am I, do I really want to spend, you know, a long time listing and then packing and shipping something that's going to sell that's going to make me a four dollar profit when i could be spending investing the same amount of time in something that's gonna make me a forty dollar profit probably not so totally yeah uh, but again there's i really just don't think there's any rules like do what feels good to you yeah, i mean i like to have an assortment of price like especially in poshmark because i do like to have those high-end buyers but i also like to have the you know the the casual, more casual buyers that are, um, you know, looking for, you know, the Ann Taylor and the medium brands, and they don't really care as much about brands as as um, other buyers might. Style or cute print and stuff. Yeah, they're looking. Yeah, exactly. So. It's really snowing. It's like. Oh wow! Yeah, it's, it's oh, uh, rainy here. Uh. Summer. Um. Cool. So I hope I hope that was helpful to you guys. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you for all the amazing questions. And if you're watching the replay and you have more questions about anything you know we said, um, please, please comment. And we would love to. Yeah, we love questions. Mm -hmm. And you'll see too, if you comment on our YouTube channel, that one of us, you know, we might not get to you like right away, but one of us will definitely reach out and answer your questions. We love, we love answering your questions. We love questions. Mm -hmm. Our next segment is um, breaking thrifting news. And we have actually a really, really cool story that some of you may have already seen because I've seen it circulating a lot around like social media. Um, but first, really quick, I noticed, uh, I think it was yesterday, ThreadUp sent out their, um, their winter seller's guide. So it's just this little kind of infographic of what they're particularly looking for. And, um, 
I do send some things to thread up, but I think this is really helpful to everybody who's reselling because for, or at least for clothing, because this shows you what thread ups research has shown is going to be in demand over the next few months. So mm-hmm. you know, have any of these things in your death pile, list them now. Um, yeah, that's right. It's not just for sending. It also shows you what's what to sell to, to look yeah. for. And then they also have, um, this is, I um, clicked through an email I got, but I think this is just on their website. Um, if you are not a thread up um, member. Um, so these are some of the brands that they say brands we love, which means brands that sell. So trending brands, trending brands, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, none of these are super uh, groundbreaking, but it is interesting to see like um, Lululemon and Anthropology, which are, you know, two that we were saying don't sell for as much as they used to. And they're still, yeah. It may partially be because thread up sells a lot of it. So, um, you know, it's a little bit cheaper on ThreadUp than it might be on Poshmark or eBay, but that is, you know, good a good signal that these brands are still in demand. Oh, yeah, they definitely are. Like, I will still sell my my Lulu and my Anthro, and it, they just might sell for a little less or take a little longer to sell. But yeah, um, just a couple quick questions before I finish or go on to the next story. We have a Facebook page. Not yet, but we no. definitely are going to start one. So be on yeah. that. We will. We will let you guys know. We'll be starting a, a, a fan page, I think, but also like um, we future, we we do have plans to start a group in the future. Yeah. Which again, one thing at a time. But once we once we get you know a little more in a um, little more of uh, the YouTube shows and whatnot under our belt, we're going to work on that. Yeah, and this is it's so funny, Elizabeth, that you mentioned this because I almost did, and then we we moved on um, to get poly bags to store your items in. Absolutely, one of the best things you can do when you're starting out, especially if you have cats, because that was a problem I had where I would even storing them in just like a you know somewhere I thought was safe, it would still get cat hair on it, and every time I sold an item, I'd spend like half an hour meticulously making sure there was no cat hair on them, and it was such a waste of time. So individual poly bags for your items. That's a good, you know what, also when I lived in my house in Philly, our basement flooded and I had a lot of, my, my luckily my inventory was in, for the most part in um, like the rubber made storage bins, but I had a couple of them that had cracks at the bottom and some of the water absorbed into them. Yeah. So if they had been in those poly bags, I wouldn't have lost some of the inventory that I lost. So that's, you know, that's that's really good. good tip. So, and you can just ship in, in them too. Yeah, it's yeah, they they make it even easier just to like slide it into a poly mailer, slap on the label. So. Oh yeah. Fantastic tip. So so this is the story that I was really excited about. Um it is on NPR and there's a, a written piece, but um there's also a um an interview with Terry Gross, who I love as a fellow Philadelphian. Um and she talks a little bit about Philly in this. Um, so I really recommend, you know, this is a great listen for while you're listening or something. Um, so this is an interview with an author of a book that just came out um, that is called, um, I believe it's called, sec- it's actually called Secondhand. Um, yes. Um, and his name is in here. <laughs> right now, Adam Minter. Um, I did immediately go to my library app and see if it was available in ebook for my library, and it is not. So I may just end up buying it. Um, but it's kind of ironic to buy a book that's all about how much stuff there is in the world. So, <laughs> yeah. so this book is all about um, the the waste stream of goods in the world and the, the circular economy and what happens to everything when you donate stuff to to Goodwill and other thrift stores. Some of it, um, especially what he talks about in this in this little um, clip, is stuff that we've already known. Um, but a lot of it is not, not stuff I knew before. So he goes into a little bit of detail about how Goodwill employees, um, you know, sort items. And one thing that was fascinating to me is I think maybe we've suspected, but this is confirmed that they actually have a flow chart of brands that um you know so they'll just they'll get an item they'll check the brand and look on the flow chart and see if it's you know a boutique brand or a something to list on shop goodwill or something that's you know uh should be list or marked higher than everything else um but he also mentions that the list is really outdated and that a lot of times it is up to the employees to make judgment calls 
And also that only one third of the goods that make it to the floor of a thrift store are sold. So that means, and that's after everything is sorted and much of it is already deemed, you know, not good enough or uh, too worn or, or, or damaged to go on the floor that, you know, still what does go on the floor, um, a lot of it goes unsold. And so he does, he shouts out the Goodwill outlet, which I thought was funny. He's like, oh yeah, there's, there are places that are actually outlets and, you know, <laughs> sure any of us listening would be like, yep, I've been there. <laughs> um, but I just thought that it was a really great, overall, it's a really great argument for what we do. And in the, in the title, the headline is the best thing that you can do is not buy more stuff. What he really is talking about is what, you know, not buying new stuff. First, and yeah, yeah, like like going out into Macy's versus going to the thrift store. And, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you said, you know, like about the, the flow chart and all, because I think a lot of the stuff ends up at the bins because of that reason, because they're marked boutique and they're like, I'll see a lot of stuff at the bins that's marked boutique and it's got like this ridiculously high price and it sat there because nobody wanted it at that price. Yeah. So it ended up at the bins, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, and, you know, and then just the opposite happens where you can find things really good deals because of, um, you know, I know at the, at one Goodwill, which I won't um, mention which one it is, but you know, Lola, um, <clears throat> there's a ton of seven and, um, and, and true religion jeans. Like, I mean, like a whole row of them and they're all marked for, you know, like 10 bucks or, or more. And I think it's, you know, it's just because the, the, the brand is not as, doesn't sell as well, but they're, that's what, you know, they're, they're pricing them at because they're probably in that flow chart. Yeah. And then the first part of this, this interview, um, I just, I found it was so beautiful. It, he talks about how the idea for his book came from the fact that his mother passed away and he had to donate all of her things to, or a lot of her things to the Goodwill and how much you really just want everything that you're giving that was meaningful to someone you loved that you want them to have a good home and you really just trust that thrift store to find a buyer for them that's going to love the item and i think that's exactly what we do you know when we when we find something in a in a thrift store and then list it on ebay or list it on you know on poshmark or anywhere like that but especially ebay because this is you know more like older vintage things you're do you're putting in the work to find a bigger audience for it so it can really find that home where it is you know it's going to a collector who appreciates the craftsmanship or it's going to someone who's going to display it proudly and and that's you know where we come in that we are the ones who are able to find that home for things yeah. that otherwise you know may end up in the landfill and you find a lot of this too is, is how much ends up in landfill yeah. yeah there's so much textile waste that it's a shame um I'm reminded of that when I see items like, like I happen to have this lap blanket on, which I showed last week as one of my items, but um, this, this, somebody made this but way back in the seventies, the person probably is deceased by now, and, but somebody took the time to make this with somebody's mother or grandmother or, you know, and they took the time and now I'm enjoying it. It's not in a landfill because, you know, it is something that I thrifted and I, and I appreciate it and love, you know, love this. This is one of my favorite Afghans of all time. I love the colors. I love the warmth of it. I, you know, so, <clears throat> you know, things like that. Or when you see somebody's name on something. Yes. I was gonna say. Yeah. That, and you know, like it just, it makes, it reminds you, this was somebody's, you mm -hmm. know, valued possession at some, at one point in time. I, um, but when I buy, especially like like needle crafting stuff, a lot of it in the 70s and 80s, it was all by mail. So, and if I buy a big lot yeah. of it, some um, of the sewing patterns have the dresses. Yeah, and so they they have the address of the person who it belonged to on it, and I will Google the name, and you know, nine times out of ten, I find their obituary right away, and I just like to take a moment and read their obituary and just like say, you know, if they seem to be religious, like say a prayer for them and and remember them because otherwise, I mean. I never met them, you know, I may never met their descendants, but they were a person and we had this thing in common. We both love to, you know, yeah, so it's, it's that is the, definitely the beauty of what we do. Yeah. So anyway, highly recommend listening to this. I'll link it in the description, the YouTube video description. That's another good thing for our, when we get our mailing list off. Um, and yes. That was yeah. so we, we are working on our mailing list and it will be full of things like this. Um, 
but I also am definitely going to read this book and I'm, you know, if anyone else wants to read it too, I think it would be fun to do like a, you know, little review episode and then if other people have read it, it could almost be like a book club, but, um, or as you know, part of an episode to, to let you know a little bit more about um, what I think of it as a reseller and, and what I learned from this book about kind of what we're a part of. So. Yeah. Okay. And market report. Our market report. Um, so, so our market report, we talk about our last two sales, not necessarily our best sales, not necessarily our mm -hmm. does, not our score, but, but what, whatever it was. So it's kind of like, you know, luck of the draw. And it shows you not only, you know, that we do make mistakes. It shows you that we have successes, but we also have things that, you know, don't sell as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's kind of a, a, a learn, a, a little education. So. Totally. Um, oh, I think your items are first. Okay. So I, oh, so what are you, what happened to it? It's not loading. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> are you voting? Uh, okay. Well, I, so okay. So I, my my items are were sold on Poshmark, and I have um I sold a oh, pair. There it is. Oh, so these are are the brand is Volcom. The style name was Pristine insulated snowboard pants and they were a woman's extra small. So you know I knew they weren't going to sell quite as well. Can you zoom, can you just click on one of the like of the print? Um, oh, um, this is a screenshot. Oh, it's a screenshot. Okay, never mind. So it's it's different faces, and um, it's it's like it's like kind of like almost like Picasso esque faces, you know, in this. And it's 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 really it's a cute print. It's adorable. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, these are gonna sell. I didn't even know the brand. I didn't know anything about them. I knew they were snow pants. That's about as much as I knew when I saw them, just based on that. Well, this was a local thrift store, and they had a sale three for $10. And when I got into the register, she was like, Oh, these should have been marked separate at like, you know, <laughs> dollars or something, you know, they should have had a set, but she's like, since they don't, I'll just give them to you for three for 10. Like she was a little, she seemed a little, a little bit annoyed that they were, but she still honored, you know, her, her um, word and gave them to me um, at the three for 10 price. So I would have paid more for them, but I did pay like three thirty three approximately for them. And they sold on Poshmark, just um, overnight for $60. So, and that was not a, a best offer. I did have them up for higher. I had them up um, around a hundred and um, I reduced them a little bit. And then I took a best offer for 60, which I thought was was very fair, especially considering what I paid for them. So, and that the fact that they're an extra small and they're going to a buyer in California. So. Ooh, um, they're gonna be doing some snowboarding. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, that was a really cool um, purchase, and and I was very happy with that sale. And then the next sale was actually I um, I was vegan so cool. for time. Yeah. yeah. So this is an ombre purse, and it, ombre means it's like a gradient, um, and it's also vegan. And this brand, Pixie Mood, actually kind of um, they public they they kind of brand themselves and advertise themselves on the fact that all their items are vegan. So it's one of those type of companies that, that's why I mentioned, I will usually mention vegan and something that is, but especially with something that has a following for being a vegan item. So it had that and it, it was a cross button and it was like brand new too. It was it really good shape. So I sold, I took a best offer on that for $32 and I was pleased with that too. I paid, I think $4.99 for it, somewhere around there. So. Um, and I should have given, I, Lola, I usually give you the prices that I, I buy them for. Oh yeah. I figure we could just say them this week. But yeah, that's fine. So, so yeah, so I spent, so that was a decent sale too. So my two of this week, I would say were, were, were pretty good sales, you know, yeah. from my two last sales and they were both, those were both on Posh. I did sell some things on eBay too, but, um, those are my last two items on Posh. Just a note on something you mentioned, um, that I don't think enough people know it's a state by state law, but some states in the, in, we're talking about the United States, of course, here. Um, do you have a law that if something is mismarked, the mismarked price must be honored? Oh. So I don't know about New Jersey, but Massachusetts is like that. And I remember working retail when I was in college here and we were all taught. Yeah. Like if you, you know, we had to be really careful because we had these like, um, you know, the price guns. Sometimes the sticker would get onto the wrong item. And if it was on the wrong item, we could be selling a super, it was a yarn store. Oh, okay. 
something super expensive for two. Yeah, I don't know. If she. Yeah, I wonder if she gave it to me on ethical reasons or for just because that was her. But she she was like, oh, this should like, and they probably maybe they should have been tagged. She's like, I don't know why they didn't tag them individually. You know, they should have been. She was a little annoyed about it, but I did get those. I still got them for. Yeah. So you know that she may have just been doing it um, because it's the right you know customer service thing to do, yeah. but. If you're in one of those states, you know, research your local law. Interesting. This would be Very great. interesting. And so this week, um, I actually only have one sale, and I started off feeling kind of embarrassed about this, but I thought it was a mm -hmm. good to talk about, you know, some of what is like real life. So, um, as you guys, if you're return viewers, you probably know I missed the last show before Thanksgiving. Um, and I was really sad about that. And Nadine, you were such a great trooper for sticking it out and right. it on your own, um, especially because I do all the tech stuff. So let me tell you, I realized that I mentioned this in the show. I realized your value that like, not that I don't know your value already, but I was like really like appreciating. I was like, oh my God, Lola does all this. How does she run the show so smoothly? And because, yeah, because I was not as smooth. It was very clunky. Yes. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I've mentioned this a lot, but I have I have chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a more serious thing um, for some people, for me, and you know, not for, not for everyone. There's a huge gradient of um, of ways it can, you know, impact people's lives. But um, I generally um, am pretty housebound. I I leave the house maybe once or twice a week. Um, used to be when when I was living near Nadine that that was like the main time we would, um, I would get out of the house and we'd go, we'd go thrifting together. And, um, I just had a really bad flare up for a couple of weeks. I was just doing really, really poorly. The day of the show, I actually felt, um, this is like kind of the most severe it can get. It was sort of like, I was paralyzed in bed. I could barely lift my head and just enough to tell Nadine, I was like, I can't do it. I'm so sorry. Um, so I, I wasn't listening. I wasn't sure. Her exact words were, I feel like I'm dead. And I was like, oh, she's having a really bad day. I knew it was bad. Yeah. Um, and that's, I don't want like a pity party. I just, you know. No, no, no. The, the reality of, of kind of how things are. So, you know, I was not listening. I was not sharing on Poshmark. And I've been trying to focus a little bit more on Poshmark. Um, and, and the, you know, the result is you don't make sales when you're not listening and you're not being active and you're not you know, nurturing your shop. So, um, so I had one sale and that's, and that's the reality. And, and, um, and then I ever ask. so this, yes. Um, so this awesome fabric was, um, found at the bins and I paid, so I met, I weighed it when I shipped it and it was about 10 ounces. So less than a dollar. Um, and it went for, I think I actually accepted an offer for 20. Um, you were with me when you bought that probably. I was, yeah. I remember it, yeah. Yeah, I was super excited about that one. Um, and it was hard to list it because um, it was so cool. I would have loved to use it for something. But it, I, it is very MC Escher-esque though, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it really is. Yeah, it was very fun. And the, this uh, company, um, a Pasco Status, has a lot of other kind of like off arty, um, very trippy patterns. So I'm actually... Now I'm like kind of keeping an eye out for it on eBay. Maybe I'll find one that mm -hmm. I'm in love with for myself. And <laughs> well, yeah. spend that twenty dollars I made on on fabric. Well, well, hey, that was you know I have to say that was a good good sale, and you know at least you sold something. And thank you for sharing, Lola. Thank you for sharing that um, to everyone and not being you know being transparent and not being shy about it. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked about how you know I. I had, um, have still, I guess, but you know, I'm in remission from breast cancer and I have a lot of neuropathy on my upper body because I had nine surgeries. I had lymph nodes removed. So I have a lot of pain that I deal with. Um, I have, I'm bipolar. I deal with depression. I deal with, so we all have our own things. And, you know, Lola with the CFS, um, our, our friend Tim was on and, you know, he has a spinal cord injury and he lives with that. He's in a chair. So there's so many people that sell and do this. Um, and it, you know, gives us the, thr you know, thrifting and selling, you know, gives us a way to do that. You know, when we, when we do have our own, yeah. um, you know, and, and I, I also, I, I guess I do want to be transparent about the fact that, um, I love reselling because it is something I can do when I'm feeling a little bit better that also can, it can sometimes pay off if I have, you know, good number of listings already done on those days I can't list. Um, and all I can do is you know, maybe manage to ship things out. But um, I do have a, a spouse who makes a you know, pretty good salary and um, 
for the most part, we're able to you know live off that. So I would not say I'm bringing in 50% of our income, but I'm bringing in enough that yeah. it gives me the ability to you know splurge on things that make me happy and um, and contribute to some of our bills and you know help pay for when we fly home for Christmas and things like that. Yeah, um, it helps make life sustainable. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And me too. I'm not making a load. Like I'm not like I'm not wealthy by any means doing, but I'm, you know, but it, it does make things, um, you know, sustain and, it, and it's a way to, um, I was, I'm a full-time graph. I was a full-time graph designer. I still do some jobs on the side, but I'm not, I don't have, you know, a nine to five office job anymore. And, um, you know, since, since my cancer diagnosis, I have not, and it's been a way that I can still work and, you know, make some money and not feel completely, um, you know, out of touch with reality, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and um, I, de I mean, I definitely want to be building up, um, you know, more in the next year. Um, as I mentioned, and we are going to do a whole 2020 uh, goals and and aspirations show. I think mm -hmm. uh, in the next couple of weeks, but um, you know, even as it is right now, what I'm what I feel like is a very comfortable level for me to be reselling out with my current health. It makes such a nice difference. So. I just want to give a shout out to Jenny. I saw that she had popped in and um, yeah, she said that. Oh, wow. So she was at, oh, she was at, Jenny was at the bins and that's why she's, she's, um, she's a little late. Um, so she sold a doll that she bought there this morning for, wow, for, that was a quick sale for eighty eight ninety nine plus shipping. My goodness. That was, that's excellent. So somebody, one of our viewers had commented about, they were asking about the bins and said that they had gone and they didn't, you know, find, they had, you know, they thought it was just kind of junky and they didn't find a lot. Maybe that was just a bad day. But let me tell you, there is always something at the bins. Even when you, it is one of those kind of, quote, junky days, that's, you know, you might not find, um, you, you might find that diamond in the rough on those days. You might not find a home run, but you might, but there's always something good. Yeah. That's amazing, Jenny. Excellent. Um, and congratulations. I will just add that that's a great argument for, you know, watching different YouTube sellers who sell in different niches and kind of try to pick up some of that knowledge because I think it'd be really, I probably would have seen that doll and not known. Yeah. I probably, I have to, yeah. That's so. specialty knowledge that just made Jenny, you know, what kind of doll was it, Jenny? I'm curious. Oh, she sold it this morning. Well, still that's a quick sale. What kind of doll is it? I would like to know. And Elizabeth has a question for you too. Lola. Oh, and uh, Elizabeth, this is so sweet. Um, you can with the time you have and take good care of yourself. That is such a sweet thing to say and definitely I think goes for everyone um, who's watching this. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do I, I love that. Do what you can with the time you have. Yeah, and Lola and I understand each other very well um, because of the fact that, you know, we both have mm -hmm. our little things going on and, you know, so, um, you know, so, so definitely be empathetic to other people. Like, you know, it's it's definitely not um, fun. Nobody does want to be sick, you know. But we make the best of what we're given. The cards we're dealt with. Yes. So yeah. Um, so Jenny, if you if you can, I don't know if we're at the end of our show now, but if you happen to, oh, there we go. Okay. American oh, Girl doll. Wow. Yes. Okay. It was made in Germany. I should check. I have a couple that were mine when I was growing up, and I definitely plan to keep them. You know, like there's our age gap, Lou. I know. Um, so. The, one of my dolls. I have American doll before I was when I was when I was growing up. I was a little bit old for them when they came out with Josefina, who's the Latina. Um, she's like indigenous Mexican. Um, I think she lives in like Texas before it was America or something. Um, I forget the whole story, but I was so excited when she came out. That yeah, yeah. I, As a Latina, yeah. what? As a Latina girl, you yeah, are yeah, like, um, because before that, the only one, role model, yeah, yeah, Definitely. the only one that looked like me was Samantha, and she was like a rich white girl. I was like, I don't, you know, I, and I do have a Samantha, but anyway, long story short, um, I I bet she's worth money if I if I looked it up, and I'm curious, but I'll never sell her. Mm -hmm. Um, I did find a Kirsten quilt at the bins, um, which is like one of her original so Kirsten was one of the original girl American girl dolls oh, okay. she had like a quilt that she made for her birthday or got for her birthday I forget what the story was um but it was literally just like this you know this big I I forget if it, I used it as a sold on here but I must have paid 20 cents for it and sold it very quickly for like 30 bucks yeah so, good tip yeah well, yeah so okay 
sorry guys i know i feel like we're like tent like running off on tangents but we are wrapping up and we do have a for all of you so feel free to add a comment um by the way our show is not we, like we are not like we try to stick it to about an hour but we're not like we do. Sorry. give or take yeah so, um what unexpected lesson did you learn as a new reseller so you know what what did what were you not prepared for um and you learned the hard way that maybe someone else can learn from your experience yeah, definitely. Let us know in the YouTube con comments for sure. We one of us will get back to, um, you know, before the next show. We'll. Yeah. Oh, Jenny says this one was Kirsten. Oh, okay. he's like one in the OG American. Uh, girl. You know, way more than I do. Because I grew up, I was one of those girls. Yeah, because you're younger. Because yeah. So we Lola and I, I will give away my age. We are ten years apart to the year. Embarrassing. <laughs> I, don't think I can. My birthday's tomorrow, so I get to be another year older. Good God. I, <laughs> uh, it was my half birthday yesterday, so yeah, ready. yeah, that's right. We are we're basically like uh, ten and exactly a half, ten years apart. Ten, yeah, yeah, and ten years and six or nine years and six months. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, for my generation, especially this time of year, you would get the American Girl catalog in the mail, and everything's like so expensive, and you can't afford it. But you just like sit, I remember just like laying on the ground by the Christmas tree with the catalog, circling all the things that I wish I could buy or like I wish I could ask Santa for. Totally. I don't look a day. <laughs> no, I, I do look a day over 25. I'll say that. But thank wow. you, Jenny. That's sweet. Um, Jenny also says measure and weigh before you list. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just like we were talking about, that's one of those items that will probably surprise you with how heavy it is. And that's another good tip too, to add to our list today that we didn't mention. Yeah. Cause you can lose money on shipping when you're, when I lost a lot of money as an early reseller on shipping. So. Oh, me too. Mm -hmm. I think it's more complicated now with like um, the, uh, what's it called? First class is now done by. Yeah. And it's just, it's, Especially on eBay, it's a little. Yeah, eBay is now. Poshmark is easier for shipping. I'll have to say. How much easier? It's, yeah, you don't have to worry about all those little. It's just priority one one rate. Okay, so. Oh, and oh, yep. Check pirate ship to save money. That is something I haven't done yet, and I have been meaning to do. Yeah, Jason's talking about. It. Um, there's actually a whole episode of if you go to thrifty business shows, uh, Jason's show, and you look, uh, there is a whole episode on pirate ship that I'm guilty because I have to watch it. <laughs> but I keep meaning to get back there and watch it. But, um, but yeah, definitely, there's there's if you if you're interested in that, um, go go look at his channel and and. Um, oh, and Elizabeth has. A you know, great info that I probably should have mentioned. Um, it is an American girl is a line of dolls. They retail for about 120. Um, I did not know they're based in Pleasant Prairie. So that's why they're called Pleasant Company. Oh, interesting. That makes sense. Yeah, I know, I know nothing about them. Let's see, I was in the time of like, um, I can't imagine that must have been madness. Yeah. With a call center at Christmas season. Oh my goodness. Um, Yes, they all have a different historical story and they have uh, like little uh, easy read, you know, intro kind of novels that um, that tell their story. Interesting. So anyway, yeah, I, I love those dolls when I was the right age for them. Um, yeah, where you can find us all over the Internet on Poshmark and eBay and Depop, Instagram, uh, follow us. You know, feel free to message us there too, or you can email us at nalothrifts at gmail.com. And we love to hear from everyone. We do our best to, you know, see, read every comment and respond, especially on YouTube. We will respond to your comments. And um, if you have any suggestions or ideas for guests or topics, let us know. Definitely. So, and then uh, another reminder, just a little housekeeping reminder that next show again is on a special time and day it will be on the um on the 11th of december which is wednesday at 7 p.m eastern 4 p.m pacific time and again our guest will be zach portman who is a judaica artist and um he he's a collector as well and we'll be talking about we'll be having a great big hanukkah party it's just going to be a great fun hanukkah party everything um you know judaica themed we'll be talking about judaica 
collectible Judaica collectibles and um, you know Hanukkah Hanukkah themed items. So um, <clears throat> so you will see us dressed in Hanukkah attire, and um, my background will be decorated for Hanukkah. So um, yeah. And Jenny says y'all really need a Facebook page. So that's our second. Where are you not on Facebook? Comment today. Maybe that's yeah, a sign. Maybe that's something. Maybe that's the next thing we need to work on as a page, at least before a group. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I used to do Facebook or I used to do social media as a job, and mm -hmm. I'm, I just oh my gosh, running a Facebook page is not the most fun thing. No, but running a group is that's, that's why we haven't jumped into our group yet. We want to get some other things under our belt. For, but um, but if it if it's a great way to connect with you, I like you guys. Um, and I think it'd be okay, you know, dealing with like comments from rude people, not fun. None of you are rude though. So I think, I think, no, I think we'll be, and between the two of us, like I can do the art, uh, you know, you have a social media. So I think, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get on it. Yeah. Maybe in the new year, be a goal. Okay. Thank you so much for watching everyone. We'll you Wednesday so night, everyone. Hopefully yeah. you can join us for our, our Hanukkah, um, our Hanukkah show. That would be very exciting. We're, we're really excited to do that topic. So. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a great week.